everybody. Welcome to Squatch Zone Radio. We are now live. Man, uh, ooh, we got the, let's see, Crypto Corner. Okay. That may be Kathy. All right. Well, we're going to get to them in just a second. Uh, Kathy actually was online through her phone, which she just dropped off, but we're going to get to the Crypto Corner here very shortly. Um, uh, uh, that, no, there's Kathy back. We got a caller in already. They're either just listening in uh, for Kathy or want to ask Kathy some questions. But we're going to get, like I said, we're going to get to that very shortly. Um, just a few brief announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, we're glad to be back tonight as we try to get here every Friday night at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, a reminder for next Friday night, we do. Uh, we will be live next Friday night as well, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, with Don Peak from Don Peak's World in This Adventures, and he's going to speak about his upcoming uh, Bigfoot and Dogman conference, and that's going to be held in Louisville, Kentucky, in the month of May, May 20th, 2017, as we get ready to enter into the new year. Um, and if we have any locals here uh, out of the state of Virginia. Uh, this is a call for all Virginia residents. We have uh, we have a Bigfoot seminar here. Uh, I'm going to be speaking at the seminar. Uh, we have Mr. Michael Cook who will be joining us. He'll, uh, he'll be speaking at this event, and we're calling out for all Virginia residents. And we want you. We want to hear from you. We want you to come on out, hear what we have to say, and we're hoping to hear from you. And hopefully, you have something to share with us. Saying uh, it's going to be great. Uh, get to meet new people, and I'm going to tell you something. Uh, just within the last day and a half, I have gotten so many new reports. I mean, and I mean, I still I'm still working on getting details. Um, so that's awesome. Um, so as soon as I learn more, I'll share more. I sh- I've been sharing small information here and there on my on Facebook, uh, you know. But I'm working together on my uh, my own personal database that I got going on. So once I get everything updated and get all the details and information, uh, you know, some of the information will be shared. A lot of it will be kept confidential. So, um, and I just found out who the crypto corner is. I didn't know that was, uh, that's actually, uh, another co-host of, uh, that's joining us tonight. Um, which is Mr. Henry May. I did not know that's what he goes by because I sent him out the invite to join in. So, um, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Henry May, how you doing, man? Uh, hold on, I hear a dog. Get him on. Huh? I put him on. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, uh, Henry May, you there? <laughs> Everyone's saying Henry. <laughs> I'm looking. I'm looking at the live chat right now. Hang up. Uh, okay, you're yeah, you're breaking up really bad. I don't know. All right, well, Henry jumped out. He's gonna try to come back in. Uh, he's got a bad connection right now. But uh, Henry May, uh, he's gonna be joining us tonight, along with my co-host Shaky Junior. Shaky, how you doing, man? Man, I'm here. I'm here. How's everything? Oh, going pretty good, man. It's getting exciting, man. Things are getting, uh, you know, very uh, heated up with the ECBRO and uh, trying to keep everything, you know, held together here because, you know, it's getting exciting. we got a lot going on. Um, you know, just a lot of little things are really kind of getting exciting here. Uh, but, you know, like I said, especially the new reports that we've been gathering. Uh, I mean, and I'm sharing the reports I get, I'm sharing it out to wherever I'm able to, like, uh, I have a report, well, come to find out, it was kind of a bogus report after I further looking into it, which it was a report that I was going to share with, uh, um, uh, excuse me, uh, Tracy, um, I don't know, that report was kind of a bummer, but I got another report, actually, I, I got enough information where I was able to share that with uh, Greg Corbin, which is one of our, uh, the ECR uh, researchers that works at the Virginia Beach in the Eastern Shore down to the decimal swamp into North Carolina. So uh, uh, he's already looking into that. He's gathering information as he con- uh, makes contact with that individual. Um, 
And Henry May is actually back online with us. He's actually calling back in on his cell. And Henry, you're back. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. Sorry about that. There was something wrong with the audio <laughs> on the um, on the other one. So oh, I decided you oh calling on my cell. So um, yeah. Okay, you sound good right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know what was wrong with the other thing. <laughs> ah, okay, yeah. okay. Um, yeah. Well, Henry, I uh, now I know I spoke with you was it about a week or so ago when uh, I was joining joining you and uh, Shane, um, you know, on on real or not real, and you know before we yeah. got off, or I and we were discussing, you know, how we uh, was able to get. Uh, Kathy um, on tonight and I know you're well acquainted with Kathy. Uh, both of you guys know each other very well and yeah, um, we do. tell you what, uh-huh. uh, before we bring her on, uh, you know, I, I know you re- you've had some recent, you know, meetups with her and I was just wondering if you wanted to share a little bit of detail on what you could uh, you know, present to the uh, listeners about Kathy. Well, Kathy is a very nice lady. She's also very, very intelligent. Uh, she is a she's the forest archaeologist for the San Juan National Forest near Sonora, California. Uh, she is also uh, she also has a degree in anthropology, and um, she has been involved with the Sasquatch uh, or question for since she was a child. You know, much like a lot of us got involved when we were kids. So mm. uh, she, she, she's, she, she, she's married to a great guy, Bob Spring. Bob's a great guy. Um, I just saw them both recently at a beach foot this past summer. Yeah. So, and they are, they're actually both Sasquatch witnesses. Um, and uh, you know, Kathy, Kathy is kind of a late bloomer when it comes to having a, an actual uh, encounter and sighting. But, uh, she did have. She finally. She finally. She 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 finally knows. She she is finally aware and and very cognizant. That, yes, these creatures do exist. So. Mm. Okay. And I'm sure but, she's going to talk more about that when we when we have her on. So. Um, absolutely, absolutely. I'm very anxious yeah. to hear uh, what she has to share. Most definitely. So, uh, if, you know. Cause I, I hear I hear nothing but good stuff about Kathy. So I mean I'm anxious to get her on. Are you guys ready to get her on and get this started? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And how you right. doing, Henry? <laughs> Who's that on the other end there? Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> it's shaky, uh, buddy. <laughs> oh, hey, shaky. <laughs> Oh yeah, and Digger Dog on the uh, live chat. He's uh he's adding in that he's also the author of Giants, Cannibals, and Monsters. Ooh, I need to ask her about yeah. that one. But as we speak, Excellent she is actually book. live with us right now. Miss Kathy Strain, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing okay. Thanks for having me on. Uh, oh, thank yeah. you for coming on. Hey, this Kathy. Is a, this is actually an honor. Hey, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kathy, you know what? I, like I said, I, I've heard nothing but good about you, and I mean, you got a really well-respected reputation. Uh, I mean, you're well known in the big free community. Um, you know, I personally, I don't know where to start with you. Um, you know, because I have, you know, like with every guest, I, you have all these things. You, you, sometimes we have notes prepared, and you know, sometimes the notes ain't good enough. Sometimes, so I just go free. I freestyle it. You know, so I think that's pretty much what I'm going to do tonight. So. But first of all, I want to get a introduction. Um, I want to I want to get a little insight. Uh, now, from you know Henry was sharing. You know you've had you know Bigfoot's been with you in your mind since you were a young child. Uh, I was wondering if you kind of uh, take us back a little bit and like give us a fill in on where and how exactly did you get started with Bigfoot? Um, well, when I was a, a little girl, I saw uh, Legend of Boggy Creek on television. And um, I was really just quite affected by it in the sense that it was a mystery. My family is is originally from the Texas, Arkansas area. And so it was just, you know, I'd been there many times. And so I was very intrigued by uh, the movie. You know, I at the time, I, of course, I thought it was more of a, of a documentary and that some of that stuff was filmed live versus, you know, now that I realize it's a movie. Anyway. 
but it just became part of my life. And when I was about fifth or sixth grade, I had asked my teacher, what did I need to do to study Bigfoot? And she suggested that I go into anthropology. And so Mm. that's what I did. So I I have a bachelor's and a master's degree in anthropology. And, you know, I figured it out that, that I couldn't study Bigfoot for a living, but I, we have always, my family's always been big travelers. We always go to national parks and forests and historical sites. So it was a natural fit anyway for me to um, go that direction uh, in my life. But, you know, had I not asked that question at the right time and been given the right answer, you know, I don't know what I'd be doing now. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know if you ever thought about it, but what, you know what you just mentioned, you know, you can't make a living off of Bigfoot, but sometimes don't you wish you just could, you know, I mean, it's like, if I, if I, if it was up to me and if there was a way I would be out in the woods all the time, I mean, uh, well, you know, when I can't be in the woods and I got the extra time, I'm, you know, I'm studying, I'm, I'm researching outside the field, you know, but if I do it, you know, the full-time thing, I was so love to be doing it because it's my passion. It's what I love to do, but Unfortunately, I got to work for a living, <laughs> and it's not the yeah. kind of work I want to well, be doing. You know, I, I'm an archaeologist, but that's what I do daily, and so I'm in the field uh, just doing my regular job all the time. And so, mm. you know, if I didn't have the chance to be outside, and then, oh, you know, all I'm not out there all the time, but I'm out there a great deal. Um, so, you know, it's a it's a great job that fits me very well. Plus, lets me do and research Bigfoot as well. So it, it, it all worked out. Awesome. You know, um, there's one question I ask almost every guest. I, I, I need to get your opinion. Um, what's your belief or theory or, you know, how you want to uh, place it? All, on your opinion on Bigfoot, what is or what could Bigfoot be? It's kind of putting you on the spot, but well, you know, I, I do I no. do it with everybody. <laughs> no, I, I believe Bigfoot is uh, just a uh, currently unknown primate. You know, it's mm. it's probably closely related to us, but it's not human under any circumstance. But it's uh, probably in the ape family. Mm. You know what? I couldn't agree with you more because you know what? People probably hate my books that I'm putting out, but you know, <laughs> but you know. Uh, I love what you just said, but because <laughs> I mean, I don't know. In your opinion, like, what, I want to hear from you, from an, you know another author's point of view and a researcher and, and with what you do. How's your take on it? Well, I mean, what kind of? I'm trying to think of the best way to phrase this. Um, what to you actually points towards that direction of them being a form of ape of some of sort or primate? Well. No. Yeah, um, it's mostly because, you know, I've, I have spent a lot of time in the field and I've had plenty of time to observe behaviors and um, put two and two together. And, and they, being human isn't just um, a DNA question. Being human is, right. as, also comes with a culture. So, you know, we can write down our histories, we build things, we use fire, um, we do. We have a culture that is uh, advanced, and so along with the DNA and the, the technology that we are able to bring into our lives, that's what being a human is. And so I have observed nothing to that degree within that Bigfoot is capable of. It's it's well adapted to um, the outdoors and very rough terrain, cold terrain, hot terrain. Um, you know, dense terrain. It is doesn't use fire, doesn't have any tools that we're aware of, doesn't do anything more than what a gorilla or a chimpanzee can do just on a larger scale. So mm. there isn't anything that I've observed that would lead me to believe anything different, but and the things that I have seen uh are very closely related in predictable based on Jane Goodall's work and, and other people who have studied primates uh, in their natural environment. They're, they do exactly the same stuff like throwing rocks or throwing sticks or, um, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of stuff, uh, and vocalizations. You know, there isn't anything that I have observed that would lead me to any other conclusion. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, first of all, before I'm going to make a statement, I, I, before I say what I want to share, I do want to let the listeners, li- I hope they're listening very carefully. If they're paying attention to the way you're wording this, it's what you observed. You know, it's what, you know, you, you studied, you observed. And what people don't realize, a lot of these people say, oh, they're our type of people. They're a human. They're, you know, where are they getting their theories? Well, you know, they're making judgment off of appearances, you know. Um, but, you know, I think their parent, as far as physical tr- appearance, that could go either way. I mean, but most of what I've recognized, uh, I mean, to me, it was primate, like you said, and different features. Yeah, our, our known primates have similarities to, no, uh, you know, human primates, us, you know, but it's it just, that's that's one thing I think a lot of people fail to do. They need this, you know, you make points to separate the traits, you know, you, what are they obser- uh, observing? You know, I mean, what you just said, it's like, um, it's making me excited because, I'm glad to hear somebody else say it, you know, besides me, because I repeat myself a lot, you know, and I found a different way to put things, to put my words down in my book. So hopefully people, when they read it, they'll understand what I'm saying, you know, so I, I like how you come about that. People, again, observations, observations. I know I repeat it a lot, you know, so yeah, I mean, where are people getting the human trait from, you know, so um, I know some people believe the relic hominid and everything like that. A lot of that, I'm still learning a little bit of that information. I'm, I'm, I do a lot of studies and reading into evolutionary thing, which, you know, I personally, I'm going to be honest, I said it to others, I don't really believe or fall into the hum, uh, the evolution. I I have a different take on things, but, <laughs> but I'm not, this ain't about me, so <laughs> I just want to share that, but I like how you were, you know what I'm saying, you were putting that, so... Um, well, I, I blame a lot of it on on Disney movies because they take animals and they make them into um, uh, give them her- human characteristics like talking and having sympathy, and it has caused this generational issue where there are people who look at every animal as something that's a pet or something that's gentle and sweet and therefore more like us. And, you know, that leads them to do stupid things like try to pet bears or try to feed moose, you know, out in the wild. They just have lost their ability to separate the animal kingdom from stupid cartoons that aren't based on reality. (laughs) And and so that's what they do. They see something or believe something to be upright. If it walks upright, it has to be human. Well, there's... That's not what makes humans humans. You know, we, yes, we also walk upright, but we have an opposable thumb. We have all these other characteristics that is what is distinctive of humans. So, right. anyway, it's all, it's all Disney's fault. That's, that's who I believe. <laughs> see, see, what, you, what, you just, what you just said is, is, why, is why I say what I say. The, the, the Native Americans called them people because they walk upright, not because they knew them as people. Because they walk like a man, so that's that they assume them to be. Well, you know, and you have to realize, too, what Native Americans um, were dealing with. I mean, it, th- this was a time before science, you know, before we could genetically say, no, this is this and this and this is this. And so, of course, logically, what they knew in their brain is what is what everybody at that same time period believed, you know, that it was – if it's upright, it's human or a form of us. You know, they always they considered every animal to be their brother, but in particular, uh, Bigfoot was a closer brother. But they never lost their fear of them. And so um, they always taught um, their children, and they that's what's in my book is a collection of, of those traditional stories that said, yeah, because he walks upright, he's probably somehow related to us, but he's dangerous to us. Just stay away from him. He has his area over there. Don't invade it. We have our area over here, and we just have this this understanding to leave each other alone. Of course, you know, that didn't always happen, and they had issues with, with certain Bigfoot that would do things that didn't like it. But But that's what I would expect for people of that time period to believe, you know, just like, you know, you thought a leech could suck the poison out of you or, you know, it's just, you, we know more as we grow and as we grow, 
and our intelligence and our ability to use technology, we find new things and accept it as being part of reality, and we continue to do that. And so, you know, it's it's unfortunate because I think when people use terms like uh, forest people or that godforsaken stupid mind speak stuff that I think is just <laughs> detrimental to I mean that's just no wonder science doesn't take us seriously because we say crap like that. Exactly. You know, that, 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 they're trying to humanize Bigfoot to be our friend who is special and you were chosen because that person who believes that has something missing in their life and they gotta fill it with Bigfoot and make them feel special. I mean that's all there is to it. And it, and it's really, really sad. Amen. Oh, yeah. going on, so. I think it's safe to I say, if you don't mind, yeah, I, we're loving you on here. <laughs> I love your. Well, you know, I'm a scientist. Right. Yeah, I, 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 I'm a scientist. I do things scientifically, and everything else is crap. And and I wish, I mean, I almost think like the internet's almost been worse for us because every kook on North America has a forum to view this stuff and it's just like I don't know it's just mm. a bad bad dream that I wish would go away so. right yeah. I you know, is one of the, oh yeah what, well, you know, Daniel, one of the things I've been doing oh go ahead go ahead uh, Henry I'm I had sorry. something I was going to ask Kathy uh, what, one yeah. of my favorite Native American legends besides the hairy man pentagraph I know we're going to talk we can talk a little bit about that is what you showed Scott Walter on America Unearthed, Bigfoot's Bones. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Ooh, yeah. Oh, sure. Well, Native Americans, um, and that's I, I deal with, with them almost on a nearly daily basis as part of my regular job and, and of course, doing research for the book. Um, and it's very common, um, just like... Uh, you know, what you teach your kids today, you know, they, they, you, you assign something of, like, how you eat. You hold your fork this way. You you fold your laundry this way because you're teaching them so that when they're older, it's something they remember. Well, Native Americans did the same thing, and that's by tying, because they didn't have writing, they had oral history, and they would use places, features of the landscape, and assign it or ascribe a story to that landscape feature or location or whatever, you know, it be and tell that story so that when then that kid goes past that same spot, oh, yeah, this is what happened here. And then it gets ingrained and it gets passed on to their um, their children and their children. And so it gets, you know, carried on in oral tradition. And the local Miwok tribe here, and this is hopefully it's not too long of a story, but um, – have a story about a Bigfoot that was climbing up a cave, up a, a, a mountain up to a cave, and he was going to eat the Native Americans that were in that cave. And the Native Americans said, no, you know, we're going to kill you instead. They threw some flaming uh, pine cones into a basket that it was carrying on the back of its back, and it started to burn him, and he said, well, where do you want me to land because I'm I'm dying here. And they told him which direction to land. And when he landed, he died. And the rocks there are part of Bigfoot's bones. Well, the bones are marble. They're pure white marble. They look like bones. They're kind of concentrated in this kind of long, um, kind of linear type feature so every time a Miwok would go by that, that's those are Bigfoot bones. We killed this one that was bad. And that cave that he was climbing up to, they had a very um, superstitious belief in that cave. And so anyway, so flash forward, this is what happened in prehistory. In 1963, that same cave was excavated um, for the archaeology that was in it. And they found the remains of about 100 individuals or so in that cave. And the, when you go into the cave, it's a sheer drop all the way down. It's wow. uh, I don't know. I'd say you have to have ropes, so I'm not particularly sure how long. And I've never had the guest actually look at it because I, I don't like heights. Um, but, you know, it, it was not easy to get into. So they went back to the Miwok, and they said, hey, we want you to 
to take these Native American bones, you know, because that appears to be uh, your burial. And Numiwak said, oh, no, 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 that's not us. That's Bigfoot's cave, and that's where he takes his victims and drops them in there. Those are not our people. And they were, like, fighting with him. Yes, they are. No, they're not. Anyway, and then they told the story, you know, that we know what happened here because um, there's Bigfoot's bones and there's the cave, so that we know that that's that cave. That's not us. And fast forward to me, when I came on board on this national forest, I was tasked with the ability to go and we needed to reinter these human remains. So I go back out to the cave now, I mean, go back out to the tribe and it's been since 1963, talk to them again, and they say, nope, that's not our people, and this is why. And they told me this story. And I was like, you know, I'm just going, oh, my God, a Bigfoot story at um, work time. Yay. You know, I was all excited. <laughs> and... um so we ended up doing DNA on the bones, and guess what? Those are not their people. They knew it the whole mm. time. And so um, that's the kind of amazing stuff that you find out there that is associated with Bigfoot. And so for me, when I hear this story, when I tell this story, what it means to me is, okay, do you really think they made up a creature to assign it to a landscape feature that just happened to be absolutely accurate? What's the chances of that? Probably slim to none because they probably Mm. really did see a Bigfoot. They did associate that cave with bad things happening and all the other stuff that goes with it. And so that's the kind of stuff that I'm mostly interested in is that oral history that tells us things that we know are true, just like the Native American stories that say that they throw rocks or they do this behavior or this behavior. All of it is held out as being exactly accurate. Yeah. Very interesting. That is awesome. <laughs> hey, repeat that, Shaky. I said, did, who, did they ever figure out whose bones they were? No, we uh, still have them. Um, we are, we culturally determined that they were unaffiliated with any tribe that's, that we can explain that's anywhere near here. And so they'll probably always remain uh, not on display, of course, because we don't do that, but always remain um, stored because there's no tribe for us to give it back to. Wow. Which is a big bummer. I mean, it doesn't make me happy, but it's the way it yeah. is. I don't know if this is a little off the subject. But well, well, not necessarily. I mean, we're, we're, you know, in the story you were talking about the DNA. Uh, this came to my mind, and I, I, I have to ask. Um, now, you know, the I'm sure you're probably well familiar with Miss Miss Melba Ketchum um, and everything she's been trying to do. Uh, should I even bother asking anything about her, or you could let me know? I'll shut up and sure. leave it alone. Okay. No, go ahead. <laughs> um, now a lot of people, you know, she had she has a lot of followers, and a lot of people kind of fell through and followed her work and believed everything that was said, uh, considering the circumstances and. Every other little results, and you know, uh, you know, following her claims, and you know, it's uh, some people praise it, some people, some people know better. But I, I, I want to know what's your insight on that. But versus, is there is there anything that's credible that's that might be out there that some of the public may not know that hey, maybe we actually might have real DNA related to a Bigfoot or. But back to the Melba thing, I mean, what, what's your whole uh, take on that in that situation? Oh, well, I mean, it, it's utter, it's the most unprofessional, um, unscientific thing I've seen in a long time. I mean, she, the, the methodology is false. The conclusions mm-hmm. are not supported by any kind of scientific reality. Um, it, it, she self-published it because the reason why it couldn't get published because my my a two-year-old grandson could write something more, uh, a, a better <laughs> paper than how she wrote that. It's just utter bad science, and it shouldn't be even presented as any sort of evidence of anything. And so we already know that several of our samples that, that were completely misidentified, the Justin Smeza, um sample clearly came back as bare. It's several other DNA studies so that leads you to conclude either either she lied 
about what the results were. She doesn't know what she's doing and contaminated the sample or God knows any amount of variation between that. But that's not, it's not good science. It's, it's poor science that had a foregone conclusion of what she wanted to make sure she found, and mm-hmm. she followed that path, all the while bilking money out of people to, um, to do that study. And, it's, and it's, it's, I don't see how anybody can... And it's funny because I'm friends with her on Facebook because she's a nice lady. I'm not saying anything like that. And I know a lot of her little friends always, um, you know, friend me and stuff. And I'm like, you guys just don't know who I am, so whatever. <laughs> but um, it, it's it's odd that, that the Bigfoot community shuns certain people like Rick Dyer when, in a lot of ways, Melba Ketchum is equally, if not worse. And, it, and, it's, right. and it's quite sad because it's... It's wrong, and you know, and then all that other stuff that happened afterwards. Where I, I'm not sh- exactly sure some of those stories that you hear about that a Bigfoot visited her on her farm or something to that effect. They got a little crazy in there for a little bit, but but no, I wouldn't. Oh, yeah. Don't put any stock in it. Don't read it. It's bad science. It's not anything worth saving. And then, and then I guess I can tell you about sites too. I mean, uh, there was a sample that one of the groups that I belong to sent in to Professor Sykes for his DNA study, under the microscope, it was clearly not human, clearly. None of us are stupid. Mm. We know what human hair looks like underneath the microscope. When we sent it to him, A, he didn't even acknowledge that he had received it. He did the results. He got it wrong in his paper. He said it was from Texas when it was from Oklahoma, which is very unprofessional. He concluded that it was human, and we don't even know how he made that conclusion. We had already excluded humans from being the source. And then we couldn't get the answer out of them because there was a Texas sample, but we kept going, well, this isn't from Texas. So we just assumed it was somebody else's sample. And it took badgering and badgering and badgering of him to finally find out if that was our sample or not. Mm. That's unprofessional. Wow. And so... I don't put any stock in any of his work either. I mean, I, I think that was a book already designed in his head. Those were the foregone conclusions, and I don't think he used good methods um, to come to those conclusions that I can tell because it's very right. difficult to actually figure out what it is that he did. So, But well, having said that, do I think there's samples out there that are good? I, I do. I mean, Bigfoot sheds hair, so there's got to be physical evidence out there someplace. It's just a question absolutely. of collecting it correctly and getting it tested correctly. Mm. Well, you know, Kathy, I want to thank you for getting, you know, I, that little bit of information uh, regarding Sykes, I had no clue. I, that's something, I mean, if that was known elsewhere to the public, I didn't know about it, but I want to thank you for actually sharing that information. Um, and then just back me before that, uh, everything you said, I think Dr. Haskell Hart would be in complete uh, agreement. I think Todd Disotel as well. Um, cause I had the honors of having, uh, Dr. Haskell Hart as one of my guests on my YouTube podcast, uh, just this past year. And, uh, I tell you what, I, some of the comments left under there, I guess, I guess these might've been some of Melba's followers. I don't know, but a lot of them, there were some ugly comments towards, uh, Haskell Hart, but he pretty much, yeah. uh, you know, I think you and, you know, you guys had a lot of similarities there in what you were throwing out there. Uh, basically, he broke a lot of it down. Um, now, he did. He recently did his own peer review uh, edited by Carl Sh- uh, Sheeker, and uh, I did not get the view that yet. I Hopefully, I could take a look, take a look at that, but um, as far as I know, it's public. Yeah, he also uh, has a – yeah, there's a, another paper that he wrote on the subject that's in the Relic Hominid Inquiry that Jeff Meldrum – uh, runs it's an online journal and that's really worth a read. He's mm. it's, it's quite. Um, and that's uh, in the well. What is it now? The Relic Hominid. It's the Relic Hominid Inquiry, and you just okay. type it in your Google, and it'll come right up. And he's the latest paper, I believe, that's been published on that. And it's it's probably a remix of what he did through the cryptozoology. Uh, journal, but um, I haven't read that one yet, so I don't know. But but it's 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 good. It's worth reading. Okay, awesome. I'm definitely gonna check 
I, I, I try to stay on top of that kind of stuff because, you know, I mean, because I, I, I didn't feel say it wouldn't hurt your head, but. What's that? I said I didn't say it wouldn't hurt your head. Sometimes there's, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> all those big words, sometimes you just go, ah. Yeah. <laughs> if there's something I come across, I'm not afraid to Google it or look up the definition. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's how I've come to learn and understand a lot of this. So, <laughs> you know, so people, okay. uh, yeah, so it, it's pretty good because, I, you know, I try to break things down. I'm not the best person to explain to I can What I might talk in person is nothing compared to what I could put on paper. So, you know, um, if you read what I put on paper, I'm a different person. You're like, this is not the same Daniel I know. You know, I was like, don't don't get me to talk about certain things I could. I mean, I could explain things like an elementary school kid versus a grown adult with a you know degree, you know. <laughs> but um, I mean, I I'm not I'm not you know just your normal average you know Joe, you know. I mean, but um, doing getting into this field, you know, it's a, it's a strong passion, and I, and I, I learned that science was involved in a lot of ways, so I, I put myself into science as far as do my own personal studies, you know. So. I never got no degree in it. I never tried to, uh, but, you know, I like to say it's safe to say I'm knowledgeable to a, up to a certain extent. I'm not no expert. <laughs> I'm never going to claim to be an expert in any field whatsoever because I know no, it's safe you, to And say you don't that. have to be an expert or a scientist to do something scientifically. It's the methodology right. that you want right. to carry through. I mean, and it doesn't make any difference what your background is. Everybody can be scientific. Everybody can measure footprints correctly, put in a scale. Everybody can collect evidence uh, and not contaminate it. It's not, it's not rocket science. Uh, it's just methodology that you have to continue to put in place and continue to have good um, um, skills in order to continually use it. And then it'll just become second nature. And then when you see somebody doing something the wrong way, you can help educate them as well as, no, you don't want to take that hair sample and lick it before you put it in plastic, you know. Those are, <laughs> those are tools everybody can use. Right. Plus, nope, of course, don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and on top of that, plastic will contaminate further with possible condena- uh, con- uh, you know, condensations. Right. You know, <laughs> use the paper, use the paper envelope. Uh, that's what I've been Absolutely. Uh, told. Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've been told use use paper envelope, use tweezers. Make sure the tweezers oh, yeah. are uh, are at least a little bit. Make sure they're clean. <laughs> make sure the tweezers are clean before you. Well, I, I must have done something right when I submitted my hair samples a few years back to Doctor Jeff Meldrum when he was actually accepting some samples, and uh, uh, you know, because I contact he actually was contacting me back through Facebook and. You know, give, he was giving me the proper instructions how to how and how to go about, you know, preparing it to send off. So, and you know, but as far as my collection, I was careful. I had actually a face mask and plastic gloves. That's the most I've had. But when I collected what I found, you know, I I kept I kept them in a safe container and put them, you know, in a, you know, wrapped them up in paper in, inside of an envelope. So, but um, of course, my samples came back as bear, black bear. So. Which you know, hey, mm-hmm. it was disappointing. We would have loved to have it to be something different, unknown possibly, but yeah. so. <laughs> but that's the way it goes, you know. It's what it is. <laughs> I mean, unless you see it coming off, you know, unless you personally rip the hair off of a Bigfoot, it, it is difficult to know because all animals shed hair, so it's everywhere. You know, there's. Um, I personally have collected hairs also that have turned out once I got got the results back where I thought maybe they probably weren't just based on their appearance, but it wasn't something I was as familiar with. I know bear hair. I know coyote hair, dog hair. And this was a uh, hair I really hadn't seen before, and it turned out to be raccoon. Well, I have never been close enough to a raccoon to really get a good handle on what its hair looked like. And so um, so that's a lesson learned. Is You know, it's always better to collect evidence and it be thrown out, then you not collect evidence, and it could have been the one. And so we can right. always take away the, the stuff that isn't good, but you never can put something back in that you didn't collect because oh, you absolutely. didn't take the time to collect it. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, oh, man, I just lost my train of thought there. for It'll come back to me in a second. Oh, no. Uh, no, I, I was just going to make a mention. Like you were talking about the, the wreck. 
a lot of people don't re- know or, or realize raccoons are kind of like bear, uh, a black bear. Black bears come in various colors. A black bear is not always black. <laughs> they have blonde, cinnamon sure. blonde, cinnamon brown. You know, they could have white in them. When it's just like a raccoon, they're actually got red. They could have red, brown. You know, and people. Oh yeah, it, it wasn't so much the hair, the hair color that threw me off as where it was, and because I just couldn't get it in my head. What, what, where the hair was found was along a barbed wire fence and the top wire of a barbed wire fence, and I can hmm. see animals going under, maybe even the second, but walking on the top wire. I mean, it was just like that's why I collected. I thought it was unusual and it would have been something trying to step over it, but instead it was some and I know which raccoon it was too because I I recognized him. He he's a turkey. Oh, okay. He's Texas too. So um, anyway, but um he must have walked across the top of the barbed wire fence and got his hair snagged, but it was I just didn't think he was capable of it because he was kind of big. So <laughs> apparently they do that. Oh, so. you'd be you'd be surprised what raccoons can do. And one mm-hmm. thing that people should be cautious of when they when they put out uh, food items, even if they're wrapped up, raccoons have a lot of people may not realize raccoons have very very dexterous uh, hands, as it were. Yes, and they absolutely. can open stuff up, and you know they, they can open even yeah. like plastic wrapping and tin foil oh, and they, all that. Yeah, and, they can open uh, up a ticket. Yeah, canned goods. They could rip open a tin can that we have to use a can opener for. They could do that with their bare hands. My father's actually witnessed that, you know, hunting them. <laughs> so, but yeah, they're very so incredible if, little if, creatures. If people think they're feeding a Sasquatch, you know, they may be feeding a raccoon instead, you know. But what, what you should do is, now, I saw something D.W. Lee put out on his blog today, which I thought was an excellent suggestion. He said you take some thread... You stretch it out, just regular, just regular, regular thread. You stretch it out between two trees at certain types of, uh, at certain levels. You know, if it breaks below, if if it breaks at the below six foot level, it's probably not a Sasquatch. If it breaks, let's say about the seven foot or eight foot level, then you probably got one in the area. So, because um, they'll walk right yeah. through, it. they probably won't even, won't even see it. Yeah. So. Yeah, we, we use that method as well. And then you can also uh, tell which direction it was moving by how it then – you can't tie one side too tight because if you do, then it, they'll fill it. But if you tie it just to like seven foot tall or so and you leave it fairly loose, when it walks, it will carry the thread with it and it usually wraps around a branch or something as it goes, and you can tell which direction it was walking. And so those are I, those are easy tools. I mean, how much does thread cost? You know, 98 cents at Walmart? I mean, there's no reason not to use something that's that simple and easy to use. You just got to remember where you put all your traps because that's mm. always the key of finding your trap again. So. Mm. Interesting. Um one more question I want to ask you uh, concerning hair and samples before I, I kind of switch this up a little bit here. Um, how familiar are you with uh, M.K. Davis and the, some of the oh, translucent yeah. hairs he has on his? What's that? Um, I'm familiar with M.K., but I don't. I do translucent. That's the first time I've heard of that. I don't believe. Yeah. I've, I've heard. I think um, Hen- Henry, you're a little familiar with that, aren't you? As far as the hair that the MK Davis has, uh, yeah, some of them are kind of odd. And different. This is actually my first time hearing about this. So, <laughs> you know, uh, actually, it was a uh, Bono Russell actually shared a YouTube video from uh, MK Davis. Uh, you know, it, I don't know nothing about. They appear to be translucent. Uh, some of the fibers and the hair uh, that he has on the video from underneath the microscope, uh, they do appear. I mean, they. I don't mean. I'm not entirely familiar with hair that's something my plan on getting familiar with in the future because i plan on buying you know studying and getting involved with that later so i'm slowly trying to learn and get myself into this i don't know nothing about it right now to be honest with you so <laughs> um but they appear i guess you could say they almost look clear like they have a almost like a see-through kind of image if that makes any sense so i don't know he supposedly these are hairs uh, these different fibers of hairs he found in a like a almost like a ball of fur. Uh, 
I mean, it could be any other animals, but, you know, as far as I know, there's been no study on them. As far as I know, that's why I was asking if, you, if anything like that. I'll have to try to find the video, and I'll have to send it to you, Kathy. Uh, it's, yeah, uh, I, I haven't heard, heard that before. Because um, okay. if it's translucent, you would assume it has no pigment to it. And um, right there, you could probably narrow it down to what it is. I don't know, but, you know, it's... I had not heard that before. I, I wasn't aware that MK was still active in the Bigfoot community, so that that by itself is a surprise. So. Mm. Okay. Uh, we actually have a question here on the live chat for you. Um, uh, as user uh, Digger Dog <laughs> has a question. Uh, he's asking, he or she is asking, what has happened in your research area this year? Okay, that's Dave. He's a, a good friend of ours. Um, okay. Yeah, I know I know him. Um, this <laughs> year, uh, well, the most probably exciting news that we had, um, uh, I, I, I'm here in California, and most of the time we have done research, 99.99% of the time, uh, in our own backyard. But in 2013, we had a, one of the largest wildfires that ever burned in the state of California, known as the Rim mm. Fire. It was two. 51,000 acres. So you wow. think that's, that's an, entire, an entire state back east, you know. And so because of that, it totally devastated um, where we do research because, you know, there's so much habitat loss, we don't know where they went, you know, because obviously they fleed from the fire, but where did they go? I don't know. Anyway, since 2012, though, the year before the fire, we have been doing research in Oklahoma with the North American Wooded Conservancy. And this particular year, uh, 2000, it was 2016 still, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, we uh, had a fascinating incident happen in 2015 using that same thread method that um, uh, Henry was mentioning, the DW, had spoken of, and we had attached to various thread traps throughout where we research these burrs, like a huckerbur. Inside the huckerbur, we had put a radio transmitter. And the, the idea, of course, is that whatever walks through the, the line pulls the magnet off the radio transmitter and then gets that burr stuck in its fur. And we can tra- we can find it, track it. Well, in August 2015, that's exactly what happened. Something went through a seven foot tall uh, uh, line, activated the radio activator that you have to use an antenna to track, and we followed it. Not not we as in Bob and I, but we the group followed it from August until. Uh, into 2016 and got some excellent, excellent data of how large whatever this animal was, uh, territory is. It's extraordinarily large. And so there's going to be a paper that's coming out about that that provides uh, much more detail. Um, unfortunately, the, the radio tag has a, a shelf life because it has a, a transmitter that can only go for so long, and so we lost um any further signals, I believe in June was our last signal that we got from it, uh, but the data that it can potentially help people do research for, um, uh, I think will be very valuable to the future of Bigfoot research. Mm, that's very impressive and very interesting. That is the exciting kind of stuff to hear. <laughs> you know, well, something, it's, it's, you know. It's something that it's it's relatively cost effective, but you do have to be dedicated to follow that signal because, I mean, it's you know, I I, I hesitate to give any numbers because I've been I've had a cold for I swear the last three weeks and all the medicine I've been taking I've lost brain cells or something, but um, it's a very <laughs> large territory and and the tracking methods and everything if if it, and it wouldn't surprise me I mean everybody would su- su- would suppose that a Bigfoot would have a large area in which it would gather food or travel or, or do any one of those things just because of the nature of um, the food resources that any one area would have. And so it was no surprise, but it, it was even more than I would have guessed. 
you know, but then, you know, what we know about animals in the wild probably would surprise a lot of people of how far, like even mountain lions are willing to travel for, for food or other things as well. But anyway, that, that hopefully will be out uh, early in um, 2017. Very awesome. I'm definitely yeah. looking forward to that. Now, uh, now earlier on the live chat, I was paying attention and there, it was a title of a book that you're author of. Um, if I recall, I know it's, uh, Without looking back, and monsters and giants. Um, it's, it's giants, cannibals, and monsters. Bigfoot yes. and native culture. That's right. Well, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? That sounds sure, very interesting. Sure. What it is, I like is, that. It's a it, well. If you have any interest in Native American stories, and you know, not everybody does, but it is a um, a book filled with traditional Native American stories about Bigfoot. They, and it's grouped by cultural area. So, like, the state of California is considered a cultural area. Then you have the Pacific Northwest, uh, you know, Oregon, Washington, and into Canada. You have the South. You have, you know, the East. And so they're grouped together so that you can see the similarities between groups of what they believe a Bigfoot to have and what characteristics that they have. And then in the back is a uh, list of every word that we know, uh, Native American word for Bigfoot, what it translates to and what group it belongs to. So that's just a good handy reference tool. But um, anyway, it includes uh, all of North America. It's uh, Canada and coast to coast from Texas to Canada, from California to New York. It's got everything in there. The only places that don't really have anything represented is basically a little bit in the Midwest, like in the Kansas, Iowa area. There's very little that comes from that area because they were so, they moved so much during early American settlements that that their traditional stories just weren't captured anywhere that I can find. Mm. So so that's what the book has in it. That's pretty cool. Um, Now, uh, the as far as different states, I mean, do you, uh, as far as with what you do with your line of work, uh, I guess it's kind of a stupid question. I assume that you travel. <laughs> you probably get across the different parts of the country, don't you? Or, or do you primarily stay um, on, on the West Coast? Well, I mean, as far you mean, as my job as a, a forest archaeologist? Right, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I'm the head archaeologist for this national forest in California, and so my job duties are only uh, involve my national forest, which we're next to Yosemite. Uh-huh. Somebody needs a reference, and so um, I direct all, you know, the archaeologists that work for me, and uh, when I was, before I was a permanent employee, I did go and work for contractors doing archaeology all over the place, but, but with the Forest Service, you're in charge of just your your location, and so I don't have if I'm unless I'm doing training or something like that. I I pretty much am stay in my zone of area. So okay, yeah. I, I, the reason I asked, I was just wondering if you're you know you ever gotten here on the East Coast, like specifically the state I'm currently living in, Virginia. <laughs> if you know anything about well, Virginia, I've been, there, I, I've been there on my own time traveling before. Oh, yes, but not okay. the work. Ah, just uh, any particular area? Uh, um, well, we have relatives there, I believe, and and it's been a long time. But yeah, we've um, it's a beautiful state for sure, and oh, all yeah. that area is very beautiful. I mean, the the potential for Bigfoot habitat out there, I think, is pretty substantial. It's beautiful, beautiful country. So, but no, oh, yeah, I don't absolutely. remember the city or anything. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, if you ever get a chance, you're welcome to come out here. You know, you and Bob come on out here. Uh, if you guys have had some time on here, just come out camping here in June. <laughs> we got one of our uh, EC Bureau annual uh, expeditions coming up here towards the end of June. So, <laughs> oh, cool. you guys are more than welcome to but come out here and camp with us. So, <laughs> so it's much nicer back it? there in June than it is in September. I tell you that. <laughs> no. I, <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because uh, I don't know if you guys. Getting snow out in your parts of California or not, but I uh, 
you know, we've had our first little bit of snow here recently, and it's been a, you know, it's it's been a cooler winter than last year. Last year was very mild. Uh, you know, a lot of our snow. Sometimes we probably, we may not get a, you know, a hit with snow till another month or so. That's where it's, it's the way it works over here. It's weird, you know. You know, obviously, I'm originally from the state of Massachusetts, but grew up down here in Virginia, and I can recall as a young child. Yeah, we had lots of snow up north, but <laughs> but down here it's a different story. So I mean, <laughs> but um. Yeah, no, we but yeah. get snow. Like I, we're by Yosemite, and so we get uh, we have several ski areas in the area, and so we get snow. Luckily, not as low as where we live because I hate shoveling snow. Hate. <laughs> yeah, I do too. We have a long driveway, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, now, Daniel, I had a quick, I had a quick question. Oh, absolutely, Kathy. Um, absolutely. Jump in the, um, get get your perspective on the Tahoe Scream, which was uh, was it Lake Tahoe? Or was that on the? Mm-hmm. I, I can't remember. If it was on the California side, or if that was on the Nevada side? California side. Okay. Yeah, that 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 reporting is. Uh, what we think is the only known recording of a baby Bigfoot, and it is um, recorded in Lake Tahoe on the California side and was with witness when I used to be with the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, BFRO. And this uh, witness was having all kinds of yells and howls and all this stuff coming on. And anyway, we helped him uh learned how to put out a tape recorder so that we could get this captured on uh, tape. And and probably none of you are probably familiar with it, but it's just four high yells. And in between them that was digitally cut out is the mom calling back. And so the baby goes, well, we suspect the baby goes, ah, and then below it is the mother going, whoa, and then it goes, ah, uh, and then it goes, the mom goes, whoa, well, uh. and so she's, it's, a, it's a, I have noticed, and maybe it's just a coinkydink or, you know, just not something that necessarily happens everywhere, but I have noticed that Californian Bigfoots, if we want to use that term, are more screamers than what I've experienced in other states, and most of that is because we always have that dull uh, noise factor always going on, you know, with traffic, with different kinds of stuff going on, you know what I mean? And in Lake Tahoe in particular, I don't care where you go there, even though there are some places that are just as rugged and rural as any place I have ever been where you're not going to see another human being, but by God, you can just hear that traffic just in the, in the, just the pinch of it in the distance because Lake yes. Tahoe is one of the most recreational place to go. And so I always theorize that the reason they were so vocal there, because we have all kinds of recordings uh, taken from there, and I've personally been screamed out dozens and dozens of times uh, there because, it, you know, it, it was a really good research spot at the time. Um, but I always figured they were like that in particular because they had to get up and over that ambient traffic sound versus other places where I have been and been footed because it doesn't have that issue of traffic or other humans or whatever. They're, they're, they don't scream like that. They, they're much more subtle. They can whistle and hear each other versus in Tahoe, there's no way you can whistle to each other because, you know, you're not going to hear it. And so, um, so those are unique recordings that I think we get um, in California versus in other places because they, they, have a different behavior because they've been modified by other human behavior with our traffic. But um, anyway, that just is, we've never, I've had um, all kinds of labs listen to that recording and we've never gotten anybody to tell us what they think it is. So, so hmm. for right now, it is, we believe it to be that because of all the other recordings that came from that area of obvious and more traditional Bigfoot sounds. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah, I I, I try I try to keep uh, records of uh, some of the audio I have. Uh, most of it I upload to my SoundCloud on the computer on the internet. Most of what I got is pretty much known wildlife. Um, I do have a couple. Uh, 
I have to admit that are, I guess you could say unknown. Uh, I've tried to, you know, research other various wildlife. I'm like, could this animal actually make the produce this sound? Uh, so far, there's a couple I have not been able to really uh, match up. Uh, one particular sound I do have, the closest I have that comes any bit of close to it, is uh, a fox. Not quite a fox to me. Then again, I could be wrong, you know. But um, mm-hmm. what you know, when I listen, it, let it, other people listen to it. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say it's important to. Um, there are a lot of resources on the internet that do have because foxes, mountain lions, bobcats, they make such a range of sounds. Um, it's good to familiarize yourself with, with what those are because I've heard some crazy stuff for sure. Oh, I've yeah. been in the field and I was with somebody. They go, oh, no, that's what this is. I'm like, oh, my God. If I, had, if I hadn't had somebody who knew what that was, I probably would have left the area. It was so horrifying. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's like uh, I know – we had this uh, property we've had for years, um, and it, it's, uh, I mean, excellent hunting ground, a lot of wildlife, and we had a lot of foxes on it. You could hear them every evening, almost every evening, uh, anywhere from their screams to their, their barks, you know, and, um, you know, but this one particular sound, I'll, I'll be glad to send it to you. Uh, I'll send the link to you uh, later. Um sure. Like I said, it, it could be a fox. It very well may be a fox, but it just something about it says something different. But you know, then again, that's me, and I, I try so hard to stay logical, you know, you know, and, and just stay grounded, not to let anything be, you know, you know. I always want to find the answer. I always want to find the most logical answer to it. You know, I don't try to point things out. You know, or say, hey, this is what it is. This is Bigfoot. Hey, guys, I got a Bigfoot on audio. We don't. A lot of people could assume we got Bigfoot. We don't know because we didn't see what's producing that sound. You know, so. But yeah, we would like to believe it is. So, but then again, that's where I'm saying I try not to be that way. But so far, in my opinion, you know, being honest, I feel like it could be something else. <laughs> but um, then again, that's why I love sharing it. Let everyone else say, you know. If everyone votes on it being a fox, then then it's a fox because you know it could be. Because I mean, I, like I said, I've heard a lot of different fox screams and yells, uh, coyotes. I mean, I know that I got a lot of coyotes in my main uh, uh, research area, which is part of one of the main big national forests uh, here on the, you know in here in Virginia that actually connects to southern Virginia all the way up to the northern Virginia, running uh, along the Allegheny and Appalachian Mountains here. So, so I mean. It's a lot of lot of wildlife here, so <laughs> um. I, I think I think the best I think the best source resource for wildlife sound is I just put the link in the chat room, the Macaulay Library oh, yes. dot, org. dot org. Yeah. David Ellis was talking about it at Beachfoot this past summer. He's the sound analyst for the Olympic project. So um if, if 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 you ever hear a weird sound you don't you can't quite identify it, you go to the Macaulay Library you know, and then you look up all the different uh, wildlife noises and things like that. You know. Yeah, and David so, David has offered too that he'll he'll analyze your recording for you. Um, yes. So I don't know if you know him or not, but he's he's a good resource to have. Yeah, he is. Hmm. Um, there is a question here on the live chat coming from Mr. David Parker. Uh, he wants me to ask you, Kathy, if the ratio of males there is two to one to females. I mean, of course, that would have to, uh, you know. I, I don't know how we would know that. <laughs> right, exactly. That's a good question. You know, I'm saying that's, you know, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I, I'm, at, I'm, you know, out of respect, I'm asking the question for uh, for him. Yeah, I mean, there's, I was gonna say that's... <laughs> there's no way to know that data because you'd have to have seen every individual that is a part of that troop, if we want to use that word. Um, And so you would have to know. And statistically, I mean, it should be fairly even. If you, you know, any random coin flip, you should even out the male or female versus two to one. So in reality, of course, you you need more females than males because males can uh, impregnate more females. 
uh, and produce offspring yeah. easier than you can have males that don't have mates. And so, um, so we'll, we'll never know. That's going to have to be one of those research questions that is asked uh, once it's proven to be real and we can do long-term observations of the ability right. and characteristics. Because uh, the same gentleman goes on to uh, add on or referring to, like, I guess – he uh, from the calls, from the calls they make is what he's saying. Which now, if we're relating to them, for those of us who believe they are a form of primate or some form of unknown ape, if we, if we were to compare them, which I love to do, and I do this quite often, uh, especially in a lot of my blogs or in, in even in my books, I, I you know I, I do a lot of comparisons, and the comparisons I have here, if we listen to the sounds of our uh, the chimpanzees, for example. You're not going to know the difference between if it's a male or female screaming or hooting or whatever. They all do the same. They all have the same behaviors and same sounds. Uh, unlike a male, you know, see, that's where a lot of people compare them to uh, non human primates, like me and you. Um, if you scream and I scream, I'm going to have a deeper scream than you. You know, yours might be a little bit higher pitched, but you know what I mean? So, I mean, but again, we can't tell if, you know, because a lot of what we hear. It could be either or, male or female. We can, you know, uh, I'm just stating that for yeah. uh, David Parker. So, I mean, I, if you, if you, you know, wanted to add on to that, or if you feel different, feel please feel free to share. Um, well, in the instance of the Tahoe scream, I, you know, I spent a considerable amount of time uh, there, and I got very familiar with. Um, there was only three screamers that at least were very distinctive from each other. And what to me seemed to be the obvious male was extremely deep, guttural, extraordinary lung capacity. And, you know, like, for example, I would, we, I would call blast there. One night we call blasted, we heard this horrifying guttural response and then heard this crashing noise and I was like what in the world was that noise you know it was obviously a tree had come down but didn't know the distinctiveness of it of what was going on the next morning that tree was located probably no more than maybe a hundred yards from where we were call blasting and it was wrapped around another tree and we're talking a good sized dbh sized tree and I have photographs of it because it was so stunning like uh Whoops. So I always associated that because it was such a deep male sounding voice and the strength to take that tree and wrap around another tree as being male. And I just assume that the baby when it was calling and the sweeter sing songy type response there was came with that was a mom, just because I'm a mom and that my baby was calling to me, I'd go, I'm over here well, where are you, Mom? I'm over here. You know, that, that that's just how I associate it. Do I know the gender of who was making those calls? No, there's no way for me to know that. That's an assumption on my part. Right. We had another question hmm. in the chat room um, All right. from Flycatch. He wants to know if any if you know anyone who has attempted airborne surveillance. You mean like in a hospital? Yeah. Uh, balloon. Uh, not that I know Meldrum was working on that. Um, I don't know that I put, um, I mean, we did use aircraft to, to, to follow the radio tag. That was part of our methodology of locating it and where it was going. But as far as that being a successful, it, it, it depends on what it is. What, it, what do you, what's your outcome? What do you want out of this? And that's the basic. So is your, what you want is just to see one. Do you want to get film of it? Are you looking to get a body? Are you looking to get some kind of evidence? It's going, that is all dependent on what method you use. And so if you're only interested in maybe film or seeing one for yourself, then maybe Ariel will help you. But it just, it, you know, it's, I don't find that particularly useful personally because if you saw something, how do you circle back on it you're going to be looking at it from a height, so you're not going to be able to tell what size it is. You know, it, it just to me, I don't find it particularly useful. Right. That that was a good oh. question because you know that made and that made me think of uh, Meldrum. But I'm sorry. Go and ahead, Henry. Some I'm sorry. Researcher, some researchers also use they, they 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 utilize drones now. You know, they they buy yeah, drones. Okay. 
Jones so they mainly do I that. Mean, they, they give on, you a good aerial view of the surrounding yeah. area, but most of the places where Bigfoot, unless you're going to catch them in a meadow, the density of the vegetation from above is too dense to see anything. Drones don't have the ability to because of the weight of thermal to carry anything like that. So I, I don't, outside of some fun, you know, it's, I don't see the point in doing it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I was wondering if Kathy could tell us about, uh, about her sighting. I mean, uh, I'm love. I'm, I'm for anybody who hasn't heard this. It's really oh, amazing. Absolutely. Uh, sighting. So, um, I definitely want to hear Kathy, it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, Kathy, you, you want the us. long version or the short version? <laughs> hey, we got well, we got plenty of time. Yeah, we got. I think we got plenty of time, Kathy. So, uh, yeah, let's hear the long version. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, well, in 2012, it was in May. Uh, we had went to well an area we call Area X. It is where the North American Wood Ape Conservancy has been doing research for some time. And we were invited as outside observers, and because I'm a scientist, they wanted to just get my impression of what they thought was going on there. And you, there are, it's a very difficult place to get into. I used to laugh about, uh, because I have a government truck, I'm more willing to go down certain roads than if I was in my private vehicle. You know, because then it's, I can call on the radio and somebody's going to come save me. But this was literally probably one of the worst roads I have ever been on. If it wasn't for Bob's outstanding skills in driving, I'm not sure we would have even been able to make it in. And we have a four-wheel truck. But anyway, there's also, it's on private property and there's four cabins there. And we stay in one of the particular cabins. And so... Uh, it was pretty boring the first couple of days, and it was just like, oh, yeah, la, la, la. And uh, finally, uh, it was it's still daylight, but I, have, I don't have my notes in front of me, so I'm not really good at times. But um, a rock was thrown or something hit a roof on a cabin that was to the east of us. And so they all went down there. Um, we, there was five of us there at the time, and so three of the guys went down to check out what had made the sound, and then uh, they called for Bob. And so Bob left me there by myself at the at the, what we call the North Cabin. And so, you know, I'm always armed because, you know, I don't want to have anything surprise me, and plus this is a location I wasn't all that familiar with. And I'm looking around and looking around just to make sure nothing's behind me, nothing's in front of me, nothing's behind me, nothing's in front of me. And I'm looking down this, what we call the bottleneck. It's just, it obviously at one time had been uh, probably the driveway between the two cabins, but because really people had just let everything go, it, it, it was still fairly clear, but it was growing in on each other. And the vegetation everywhere else, you basically couldn't walk freely without being um, hit in the head with branches or or, uh, green uh, vine uh, uh, on the ground. I mean, it was just, it's just overgrown and basically had been let go. And as I'm turning my head to look back up towards the bottleneck where Bob and the other men were, I see something let go of a branch just easily. You know, it didn't swing. It just was easily, gently let up. And I could see... Um, that there was something dark behind it, but I just, you know, really, well, that's strange kind of thing. And I just kept my eyes on it. And when they came back, um, I had said something like, can you guys look in there and see if there's anything there? And uh, one of the gentlemen barely got anywhere near it and said, oh, no, there's nothing in there. Don't worry about it. And I was like, wow, really? I mean, you think I would have seen the squirrel or whatever it was in there get away, but whatever. And then, Right at that time, another rock hit another cabin, what we'll call the South Cabin. And so they, three of the guys, hightailed it over there, but I made Bob stay with me. And I said, Bob, really, would you look in there really thoroughly and see if you see anything? And like I said, it was it was still daylight, but within all the bushes, the sunlight was casting shadows. And so he sticks his head in there, and he'll have to tell his part of the story because his is much more detailed than what I know. He looks and he looks, and I can see he's looking around, and then he just yells back, no, honey, there's nothing here, just there's a couple of logs. 
I went, well, all right, well, there you go. So mm. those, everybody comes back, and we're um, sitting. There's a campfire ring there, but we didn't have a fire going because it was way too hot for that, plus it's still daylight, and we're sitting there. And I'm looking right down the bottleneck in my chair, and beside me is Bob and Brian Brown, as uh, people probably well know who he is. And then uh, another gentleman was sitting, kind of sort of looking at us, and another gentleman was sitting looking at him. And so we started hearing something walking, and you could tell it's coming from the bottleneck area, and we're looking over there, and it sounds like it's something. And we just figured it was there's a little camp fox that everybody uh, feeds and, you know, kind of sweet on and stuff. He's very sweet thing, you know, don't put your fingers up there, I'll bite you, but, you know, throw <laughs> leftovers and stuff to it. And all of a sudden, there's two Bigfoots walking at me, walking towards us. And there's this oh, wow. shed that I think that it was intending to try to get behind that shed and get a better look at it because the, the it's a big one and a little one. And the little one is the one who looks more determined, although admittedly I paid very little attention to the little one because the second it dawned on me what I was looking at, I knew I didn't have much time. Doing this kind of weird thing, and, and, and at the at this uh, bottleneck, this is where a uh, large mountain starts. This is the, the, where it comes down to, and everything up above that is now starting to get steep, uh, like a hillside. And it's very rocky, and like I said, it has that green briar growing all over it. And so the second it comes in my view, I jump up and I yell, there they are, and I run at them. And they, of course, like, oh, crap, we've been seen. And so they bolt up that hillside like nothing I have ever seen before in my life. It was like they were on a bungee, and somebody just let it go. And they just went as fast as they could possibly go up that hillside. And it was, wow. it was so stunning. I mean, it, I caught my breath. I was just like, oh, my God. And then um, of the five of us, four of us saw the same thing. The other guy, he didn't get out of his chair. He just went and looked and said, what, what are you talking about? And then didn't see any <laughs> of this action. And so uh, it then it goes up the hillside, the, the two, and then we're over there looking to see, you know, what, what's, where did they go, what happened next, and one of the other members sees the bigger one then walking away from us, gets another view of it. And um, anyway, so I was just like, I, ha- I have a mini meltdown um, just because it's just like, oh, my God, you know, did this just happen? And then, then I kind of felt like, like I was going into shock, you know, like I was, you know, literally having a meltdown because it just kind of dawned on me, like, oh, my God, these things are so fast. What are we doing? Why are we here? You know, this is this is crazy. You know, this, these, these things are faster than anything we can deal with. Anyway, so that was the end of that sighting. But then the next morning, um, I was the last one up, and I come out, and the air in the area is just still heavy, like there's something really, really wrong. And I have a, you know, I know when somebody's upset, you know, I have the ability to go, oh, well, you're obviously upset. And all sitting out in front of the porch just with this look on their face. And I'm like, uh, okay, guys, what, what's wrong? And Brian, Bob can't talk. I was, I was just got his mouth hanging open, and I said, all right, what is going on? What's going on? And Brian Brown goes, uh, yesterday when Bob stuck his head in that that bush, that little hiding area, what did he say to you? And he said, honey, there's nothing in here but, you know, a couple of logs. And he goes, guess how many logs there are now? And I went, oh, crap. <laughs> that was it. Mm. They heard the guys coming, and they stayed still on the ground. Couldn't tell them from the shadows what they were. And there they were, had been that whole time, waited for us until it was good and quiet, and then thought we had left the area, had gone over to the other cabin for the rock throw, but didn't realize time had passed me and come back. And it was trying to get closer, probably, to where we were. And so, you know, that's the kind of, I, I think it was just so like, oh, my God, you, they can lay on the ground so still and make themselves so tight that you would think that there's something else. And 
I think that's very possible because I think your mind wants to see what it wants to see. And so, right. I mean, I've had people tell me, like, they thought something was a trash bag, and they looked over, oh, it's just a black trash bag, and then they look back over, and it's gone, you know? Or they watch the trash bag or the stump rise up and walk away because our mind wants to tell us that's something common. I can identify you. I've seen you before. And then when it's not the obvious and it becomes what it really is, it's difficult for us to comprehend it. You know, we don't – it's not normal for humans to see things they don't know what it is. It's it's not our nature. We know everything. We have the Internet. We have television. We, there's no situation – that we shouldn't be familiar with. But but in reality, there are plenty of situations and things that we're not familiar with. So anyway, so that was that was my sighting. Wow. That was actually very awesome. <laughs> uh, a couple things about that I wanted to bring up. Now, uh, one thing, uh, well, regarding the last part you said there, right, as far as uh, possible tree stumps and stuff like that, uh, that kind of relates, uh, I, I, I guess you could say bears, you know, kind of, you could relate bears in the same way. Uh, one example, this past hunting season here on the East Coast, uh, my father was out hunting, and in the area he was in this past year, the, the previous year, they did some controlled burning there. Uh, and uh, keep in mind, this is also a national forest, and there was a lot of burnt up trees, stumps, and everything else. And, and uh, you know, uh, dad's pretty observant of the outdoors. And you know, one thing he was taking notice of, he was staring at some black stumps and burnt stuff but he he was saying he was staring and something didn't seem right he said something's out of place here and he kept staring and he decided to pull out his uh his deer ble- uh his doe bleat call as soon as he does it from out of nowhere he sees this big massive head pop up and of course he said it's the biggest black bear he's ever seen and we know we got big black bears around here but he 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 told me the size of what he estimated, and I that's pretty accurate on his uh you know his descriptions. And, but yeah, black bears, you know, the, you know, uh, there's a few things I've seen that I can't really explain. But knowing that there's a lot of black bears in the area, I think some of them might have been black bears. But yeah, the what you described, you know, how they stayed so still, you know, and kind of makes me think of uh I know this is kind of a funny thing, but Harry and the Hendersons. Especially at the last part where he departs, and the rest of them are right there, but they're standing so still, they're actually naturally blending in with the trees and, and the forest. Kind of, you know, it makes you wonder if somebody, where did somebody get that idea from, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, and and it's, you know, up here we have a biologist um, many years ago that saw a Bigfoot in the hills above us, and that was exactly what he had described was, is that. He knew the Bigfoot was there, but he just couldn't see it anymore. And, and and a lot of people will think, well, that's cloaking, or he went through a portal. No, that's a smart animal using its environment to hide it. Yes. And just yes. because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And I know the the you know the romantic version is to say stuff like, well, he just disappeared, or the UFO came in and got him, and, it, and that's not at all what's happening. And you know, the logical explanation is always usually the right explanation. Right. And sometimes <laughs> just they hide in sometimes they hide in plain sight sometimes. It's amazing. Mm. All kinds Absolutely. of animals do that. Deer do that. Uh, all kinds of you know. I I've had yep. plenty of that time where I walked up on something that was down bedded and I didn't even see it at all and so I was right on it. So Yep. You know, I've had that experience with deer myself, real close. <laughs> it gave me about a heart it about gave me a heart attack, but it happened. <laughs> Cause you don't see them because <laughs> they're so blended in with their natural environment. You know, it's, it's amazing. Um, one thing, uh, I mean, the, the fact oh, that go ahead. those, those creatures were li- were lying still like that in that, uh, in that bush, you know, when Bob and them looked in there, you know, the, 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 well, that, Bob, that... well, what oh, Bob wait, describes Bob. is the, the obviously larger object, a larger log, because he said it was, you know, different sizes, uh, was, it looked like it was on top of the smaller one. So I'm sure the bigger one had more experience with doing that and was making sure mm-hmm. to pin down the little one so that it didn't overreact, you know, because yeah. God knows, you know, uh, what would have happened had they popped up. I mean, all of us are armed, of course. Well, what if it had decided to pop up and there's Bob, 
with two of them, you know, God knows. I mean, I, I mean, I'm, in a lot of ways, when we talk about it, we always say, well, maybe it was a blessing in disguise that you didn't recognize what it was versus you recognizing it for what it was and something really awful happened. You know, we don't know. We'll never know that answer. But um, it was definitely the the highlight in, the, in a lot of ways, but it also, my reaction to it was I just felt like, okay, I've enjoyed the greatest thing I've ever seen. I can go home now. You know, because it was it was so intimidating of being in that spot with really just this flimsy little cabin between me and it, uh, the differences. And then, then I just got over it, and then I was not even slightly fearful. And so we, we've been back for five straight years, and of those five years, I've had three sightings. And so and Bob's had his own additional sightings on top of mine. And so... Um, you know, I just, uh, I've always been very pleased that I'm never alone. All my sightings are in the daylight, and it was, you know, other people with me. And so it's, it's, it's that's helpful uh, to have that happen because if it's at night and some creepy, just as a shadow, you know, I wouldn't count that as a sighting. It's, these are full daylight sightings, so. Mm. Now, as, as far as your colleagues, how, how do you, I mean, do you share this information with your colleagues? Uh, uh such as individuals like uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, uh, you know, and Binder Nagel, uh, you, 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 oh, yeah. you share this information. Uh, how, how do, what's oh, their yeah. take on it? Because I mean, I know they believe, or well, at least I know John Binder Nagel, I believe he does. Um, I guess it's safe to say that Meldrum does to a certain extent. I mean, um, um so, yeah. I, I'm not sure. Uh, Binder Nagel was fascinated and maybe give him a blow by blow. I ended up having a, well, it is written down, but with really precise detail, um, just because he wanted to know everything. That the 2013, I saw a baby jumping through the mm. trees, and so I'm real fascinated with that one. But Jeff, I mean, it's hard to know. Um, when I told him what had happened, the only thing he said was, "Wow." He didn't ask me any questions. He didn't particularly. I don't know. I don't know what to say. Yeah. You have to ask him about what, what, what yeah. thing, but. I, I guess he's more on the – he's still – I guess you could say he's still leaning on the skeptic side, but he wants to believe. I guess that's where – I guess maybe – I mean, I, I don't know. I, I've been wanting to – I've contacted him before where he hasn't replied. So one of these days I'm going to get him on here. <laughs> yeah, and, and he, he did see – when, when – uh, he went out in the field with Todd Standing a few years ago, and I can say many things about that. Um, no, he heard, saw I've what he thinks. Yeah, he saw what he thinks was a shadow, uh, or not a shadow, but um, a dark figure that um, that he witnessed that he feels might very well have been uh, something of interest. Um, but you know, it's hard to know. I mean, that's why I always feel very fortunate to say that mine were daylight I know exactly what it it was not a bear it wasn't this it wasn't that there's no no possibility it was anything but what it was and so those are the kind of things I think until you maybe you experience it that there's probably always just a little bit of doubt in everybody's mind that that until you see that maybe I'm barking up the wrong tree maybe I've dedicated my life to something that maybe maybe isn't really real and I don't know yeah. that about Jeff. There, I mean, I don't. Was there we any never smell? had any in-depth questions. Pardon? Was there any smell? No, uh, smell there any, wasn't any smell at that time. But I, but, but later, I don't know if it would have been later that same. So most of the time when we go, I we go for extended periods of time. And uh, the first year we only went a week because that's all we had scheduled. And then the following year, Bob went for three weeks just him, and then I went for another three weeks with just me. And so we had different groups, you know, different uh, uh, people in our group at the time, you know, and that was hard. Three weeks in that hellhole was pretty darn hard. Um, but <laughs> And it's a hellhole, and I, and I mean that literally in every, every meaning of that word. But wow. um, I don't know if it was that particular week, but later on in our experience there, I have definitely smelled – Something that is awful, and it's, it's just a foul, nasty smell, and then it goes away. So I, I don't know if you're, you're catching, 
you know, and I've smelled bears. I mean, I've been close enough to bears to know, and this was this was worse. This is like a, a to be, to me, bears smell like um, like a horse, like a sweaty horse kind of smell. Yeah. You know, this is more of a of a rancid, dangerous smell. I guess I don't know how else I would say it, but it would be a smell you would either walk through. You know, like it, something had been in there and you walked through it and it was just lingering. Or on occasion, it would be just a sudden smell that then would dissipate. And so I, I can't tell you that it is a Bigfoot. I don't know what that was. But it was it was way worse than any other animal that I have smelled before. And so um, so it's potential that, that they do smell on occasion, I guess is the word. Yeah, that's interesting because, uh, you know, there's one particular area um, – I've researched and explored quite often. And in this one particular area, there's a trail that runs deep in the woods behind a field. It goes further into the wilderness. And there's been a few occasions. Well, one in particular I can recall, I experienced a smell in different parts of that trail. Because as you further you walk back in the trail, the narrow it gets because it's so thick back there. And we have a lot of mountain laurel. And it was, you know, you got a lot of mountain laurel. There's a lot of broad down trees and dead trees. Um, and some of the smells I've experienced, uh, I, I experienced there were related to, I would associate them with uh, something rotten mixture with a strong smell of almost like dog poop. <laughs> but, you know, after considering the area, and now I, I almost want to rule this out as considering the rotten logs, because I know sometimes certain rotten logs do, depends on the the temperatures. Uh, if it's if it just rained, if if things are still wet, uh, sometimes different smells get produced from the plants and the rotten trees and you know, all the surrounding stuff. Um, so I, I kind of consider some of that because, like, I know some of that could be producing some of that smell. But at the same time, when you walk through the trail, it'll hit you. You're like, wow, that smells like like a dog just freshly pooped there, you know, where you can smell a dog's yeah. poop and the humidity or and, and the smell of something rotten with it. But, you know, and then at the same time, you always had that eerie feeling like something might be parallel in you, something's nearby. You, sometimes you might hear a limb snap over, you know, in, in the woods where you can't see because it's so thick. Uh, these kind of things I've I've experienced, so I don't know. But then again, you know, you're back there, you're deep in the woods alone. All the wild things start running through your head. You know, you're like, okay, you stop. You're trying to look around you, make sure you're not being, uh, you know, uh, paralleled or trailed by a predator or you know something. So you're always on extra alert. You know, <laughs> so oh yeah, but that's well, uh, anytime you're outside, yeah. be alert to animals because oh, yeah. I mean, there's not much. Cougar. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff out there. So, yeah. Yeah. And and I'm not saying that I know that that was a bigfoot or anything to that extent, because I I have no ability to know that. But but I have yeah. smelled things that I would prefer not to smell again, if if possible. Now it's funny, just a coincidence. I'm just now looking at the chat after I shared what I shared uh, shared with you. Uh, Digger Dog just actually shared almost something very similar, and I, I've shared what I just shared before, but I just saw what he said. Is his mm-hmm. description of the smell, wet dog, and feces, uh, and feces combo for him, the combination of a wet dog and feces for him. That's funny because you know if you think about that, that's almost a, almost similar to what I was describing. Except I'm thinking of rotten wood or something rotten, but then again, along with dog poop, I don't know. If that's it's almost along the same lines as what he said. So that that kind of makes me think maybe. If somebody else is experiencing that same smell, there's a possibility maybe I did smell something that was out there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It, no. So. Yeah, and and like you said, nature has its own smells as well. So, I mean, it's it, right. I smelled plenty of natural smells out in the forest in California that, you know, hmm. doesn't smell too great. But then again, it just depends right. on people's preferences. Are, you know, what I know people who think a skunk smells good. They don't mind that odor versus me. It makes me throw up. So, you wow. know, everybody's different. <laughs> yeah, to me, I, a I smell admit, is like dirty B.O. <laughs> I, awful. It, to me, it's almost like death. I mean, that smell, for me, just yeah. totally takes me out because I can't stand it. It it's goes to a deeper, like, ah, kind of smell. And, and fortunately, we 
because we live out in the country um, where we are, we get skunks all the time, and it's just like, uh, it's almost like you want to bathe your whole house in air freshener because I just can't get rid. It'll smell for days to me to bug me, <laughs> you know. But it's it, it depends on everybody. Everybody's got different ways of thinking what smells good and doesn't smell good. So. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah, Digger Dog said with a question mark. He's a skunk. Smells good. He said, "Not after your dog gets you sprayed." No way. <laughs> well, it's, we he actually has. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have a plant plant up here that most of because we do archaeology, we have to walk through this plant all the time. It's called bear clover. I hate that stuff, and mm. almost every time we are temporary archaeologists who come and work with us for the summer, always go, oh, I just love how that smells. It smells like the outdoors. And I'm like going, you have to be kidding. I mean, it just is, it, <laughs> to me, it just smells awful. Mm. But it's just, it's everybody else's preference, you know, of what it is. It smells good. Not everybody thinks uh, Chanel Number no. 5 smells great. Some people think it's the worst smell they ever smelled. Some people like the smell of vanilla. Some people don't. And so, you know, huh. it's all subjective. <laughs> Yeah, vanilla and uh, lavender, they're good for house cleaning scents <laughs> or air sprays, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to jump back a little bit. Um, a couple of things I want to touch base on. Uh, I want to, there's a couple of things I want to jump on. Um, now, you've, you've, uh, you mentioned you know, when you were sharing your uh, report, you mentioned that you ran after them. Um, mm-hmm. Now, I, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, there's one in particular, you know, I'm not going to, uh, some, a certain individual I'm not going to uh, bring up because supposedly he, he comes out with these bogus stories where you're within two to three feet of him, you know, all the time. And he claims he has some outrageous claims and, you know, or he takes these pictures and of course they're very inconclusive, you know? Um, and, you know, I know I've seen people question him in the past. Well, why don't you ever approach them? And then he comes. He he comes back with his reply. Would you ever approach a wild animal? Which I mean, that's a good point. But you know, I've never been in this situation, and I've I've often thought of the same thing. If I saw something, I would want to get close. I want to get details. I want to you know. I need to have details that way. I can you know give my accurate you know description of something. But I don't know. I mean, as far as running after it, 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 what was it? It had to been adrenaline. Or something oh, like the excitement, adrenaline. adrenaline. Yeah. <laughs> it was adrenaline. I was like, there they are. Oh my God, can I can I get closer and get more information? I you know, I actually can't tell you what I was thinking. I just reacted. You know, I always have all I've been doing this a very long time and I have always said, I'm not running away. You know, because a lot of people they just head the other direction. I was like, Oh hell no, this is my opportunity to to get to know as much as I can possibly know. Did I think they were going to stop and let me run into them? I, I, no. Did I think they were going to bolt up the hillside? No. I don't know that I necessarily thought what they would do. I was just my instinct was to get as close as I possibly could, get as much information as I could, maybe by some miracle of God, get some hair, something. I don't know. I mean, it just is <laughs> what it is. And um you know, and and then I didn't I didn't necessarily get all that much more detail outside the the fact that some they thought some crazy little blonde was running at them and they bolted up the hillside because I must have looked dangerous I guess, but um, <laughs> but you yeah. know it was just that opportunity to, to 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 try to get as much information as I could and and the bad part is we actually did have a camera trap set up and all you got was my butt. I'm the one who ordered it when I went. I deleted it. It's deleted. No, there's no evidence of it any further. But it was just like, I was so excited. Oh, yeah, the camera was looking right down it. And then it's just me. Did you just dig your dog? I'll ask you something about that. You uh, were talking about how fast they moved. You're talking about how fast they moved. Is that could be the reason why these cameras are not picking them up? Oh, yeah, no, the the camera is no way. By the time it triggered, they would have been well out of the frame. They, they, mm. There's nothing on earth that fast. And so you would have to have a, a 
something that was so large that it, was, it would almost have to be something, and we do have those that are called plot watchers, you know, they just take a picture every second. That's the only thing that would work, and that wasn't what that was a, a uh, motion detector type camera, and so it activated mm-hmm. when I went past it because I'm slow and it had time to activate. <laughs> wow. Huh. Yeah. That explains you know, about the cars, the game cameras. Oh yeah, because that makes you think too a lot. I mean, I mean, I know there's, I only have two cameras, and the one good one I do have, I know there's a lot more better, more advanced than that one. Uh, that one, that one particular one I have, it, it's made by Browning. It's a Browning uh, Black Ops series, and I tell you, it had, to me, I thought it had trigger, uh, fast light and trigger speed to it. Uh, you know, if I set it on photos, I set it to the minimum of three rapid fire shots. You know, I mean, and so I got a little bit, I got to observe a little bit of how it works because, you know, I had this one black bear on my camera and uh, got to see each step it was taking, which I thought was pretty impressive because I have that one image where it matches up identical to the Jacobs photo where a lot of people were puzzled about that. You know, it's like, you know, for people that are not familiar with the anatomy of a bear, um, you know, so I, I threw the two to two together on a, a, a private web, you know, you know, webcast I did. To me, I mean, I think other people were convinced with it that it was, you know, it confirmed that it, it was a bear. I don't know, you know, I, I my opinion, it, it did justice, but, but you know, as far as the, the lightning speed of it, you know, I, I feel like mine does pretty good. But like I said, I know there's a lot more better advanced cameras out there than what I got. Um, you know, but um, I don't know. You know, I've heard different ideas and theories about using cameras, um, you know, in in a in a very, you know, in a like I guess uh, have the cameras facing each other within a perimeter, you know. So it, I hear different stories, different ideas and thoughts, which you know, they're all worth trying, you know. So I don't know. Um, Digger Dog was mentioning he have to say you. He said, "Kathy, you and Matt Moneymaker." <laughs> <laughs> and he's laughing. <laughs> yeah. Then he goes on to saying something about pacing cars at 40 has been reported more than once. Ah, oh, okay. I see what he's saying. And I don't know. That's I never. I don't know if I heard that one. I guess he was referring to Bigfoot pacing cars at at 40 miles an hour. So. Uh, I think there people have theorized that because there have been sighting reports uh, that have um, uh, people driving and then having a Bigfoot stay at the pace that they're driving. But, you know, I don't know. I'm not as familiar with many of those as, as other right. people are. Huh. Well, that, that is interesting. Yeah, it always makes me think, uh, have you ever seen the movie uh, Exist, where the guy is riding off trying to go ahead and get help on his bike and he's flying he's 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 oh, yeah. pushing it on that bike and that squatch is just running i mean full speed on two feet <laughs> he gets him and knocks yeah. him well the guy ends up falling off the bike on his own but he was catching up to him at pretty fast speed there <laughs> i mean yeah. it kind of makes you yeah, think i know maybe... it was only a movie oh, i'm sorry go ahead oh I, i'm 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 sorry i uh, i what I was meaning to say, you know, it's hard to know that information because, um, you know, I'm sure they're, because I thought they're very fast, but how long can they maintain that speed? You know, is it, you know, just a short burst or is it long distance? With the difference right. between a cheetah, or, you know, a horse can do endurance. Cheetah is very fast and brief bursts. And so, who knows? I mean, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Uh, Kathy, uh, we got a caller. Uh, I'm gonna uh, looks like we might have a caller to call in to uh, talk to you here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and okay. bring them in. Hey, caller, you're, uh, caller, you're live on Squash Channel Radio. Do you have a question or something you want to share with our, our guest today? Yeah, this is your breath. I come, come again? to tell you. This is your breath. I come to tell you that you stink. Okay, this is a random caller. <laughs> okay, let's. <laughs> you never know who's going to come on Block Talk Radio. 
Okay. <laughs> I knocked them out of here. He, I I just started calling. I didn't know who it was. It said restricted. <laughs> well, ain't that something? Yeah, I hung. Yeah, digger dogs and hang up. Internet. What's that? I said you always have to have some levity, some fun. <laughs> and it was yeah. you who stink, not me. So I just want to point that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on Block Talk Radio, there's. I mean, it's worldwide. You never know who's. You never know who's listening. In, so, <laughs> but let, let me get back to. Uh, I want to jump on something else. Uh, and then I want to ask one more thing, and I'm going to give everybody else uh, a, a chance to, uh, you know, ask. You know, I'm, I'm going to go by. You know, start with uh, shaky, and then I'm going to go back to Henry. Uh, but here's something I know. This is a topic that's uh, commonly discussed along the big, you know, within the Bigfoot community. I know we've had this discussion several times in you know podcasts. Um, and part of this, what brought this up when you you were referring and talking about um, forest service, well, and then the government. Um, well, first of all, before I actually ask the official question, um, I know uh, uh, my good friend Tracy Arnold and fellow researcher shared something with me uh, where, you know, me and him, we both have uh, decals on our vehicles. Well, I did. I just sold mine. But, uh, you know, each one of, you know, of his group and my group and and the one particular area he goes into, it's all part of the National Forest and the game wardens and, you know, the law officials that ride through there. Um, you know, always question him. Would tell him, anytime he was doing something, like one in particular time, he was he had his parabolic mic and he was questioning, "What are you doing?" I said, uh, "He told him I'm listening for you know for the wildlife," and and I guess because you know they saw his decals on his you know vehicle, and he's like, "No, you can't be doing that. Hey, you got to go." Which you know that's public land. Anybody should have the right to do that. You know, you don't need to have no special permit to do nothing like that. That's anyone could go into that area and do what they could hike, camp, whatever they want in there. Well, he felt threatened by it. He felt like he was, you know, so he took his decals off. Well, and I've heard other people saying where they, you know, try to share information. People have been shut up or say, no, you don't, you didn't see what you said you saw. Um, I mean, I want to get your intake on when it comes to the government officials. Um, is there some of them maybe has some, you know, spot where they might want to shut people up on something like this on the subject of Bigfoot existing in our forest? Cause I mean, I personally know two individuals um, that were, there are game wardens or law and for, you know, enforcement agents that depend, depends where I'm camping or doing my thing at. They both come by and check on and make sure everything's okay. Hey, how you doing? And, or if I have a group of people there, I'm like, Hey, so-and-so it's me. They're with me. It's the Bigfoot group, you know? And they're like, oh, okay, cool. All right. You guys have a good day. You know, they, they leave me alone. I never had no trouble out of them whatsoever, but I hear so much from other people that they're being interfered or, or if someone reports something, they're being told, no, shut up about it. You know? Uh, so, I mean, I don't know. I want to know your intake, uh, your, your input on this. Um, I mean, what do you feel about the law and, and you know, and Bigfoot or government? Okay. Um, well, I've been a federal employee for 26 years. Um, I have never been intimidated, told not to talk about what I believe in, what I've seen. I obviously have a book with my name on it that has what I do for a profession. I've been on television many times. I've done hundreds of radio programs, never has my boss, nor anybody else, ever told me not to talk about it. It's never, uh, ever affected my job performance. I, I get all the time at the highest ranking of my uh, job duties. So I've never been intimidated by a peer. I have people who both they call the front desk or send in a message to the website. They direct those big questions to me. And I've never had any issue with anybody at, at any time. Secondly, there's a difference between a game warden and the U.S. Forest Service's federal land. Game wardens are state employees. So federal government owns the land which belongs to the people. The state is in charge of managing game animals, okay? Game animals Mm. only, so deer, 
bears, whatever it is that in your state you're legally allowed to hunt in a particular hunting season. If it is not a game animal, it belongs to the U.S. government. We're in charge of managing that species. You are allowed, unless there's some particular reason an area is labeled as being shut down, like sometimes we do meadow restoration and we don't allow people to camp in that meadow until we, the restoration is complete, you are allowed to camp on national forest system land anywhere you want. Campgrounds, mm. you have to pay a fee if you're paying for the use of the toilet and the water. Everywhere else is called dispersed camping. There is nobody who can make you leave. It is not illegal to be looking for Bigfoot on National Forest System land. And if somebody tries to intimidate you to get off those lands, you need to get their name and their badge number and report them because mm. it is illegal to do so. And so that's the difference. Now, Park Service, there's, there's three major land-owning agencies in the United States government. One is the Bureau of Land Management, and most of that, you probably don't have a lot of that in the east. Most of that is in uh, California, Nevada. It's the deserty kind of lands. Um, and mostly they manage minerals and off-road vehicle use. That's mainly their abilities, their purpose. National forests are multiple use, so we provide commodity as, such as wood as well as recreation plus protecting the land for archaeological resources, animal resources, blah, blah, blah. The Park Service and the National Park, they do restrict where groups or size of people can't because they have to. They're much more fragile um, environment. That's how we have here. Like Yosemite, yeah, Yellowstone, you know, all those parks, they're managed very specifically for that specific resource. So they do manage people. They, They don't want you necessarily camping just anywhere because of the delicate nature of it. So, but if you're on exactly. National Forest land and somebody tells you to leave or you can't do Bigfoot there, don't leave. Get their name and number. Report them. Because right. they're outside. And a state official, a state official can definitely not have authority on federal land. So that's Absolutely. even more weird. So, this is good information. Yeah, that's like Salt Fork State Park. The rangers there are very cool with people. Who you know go out and say I'm I'm you know looking for Bigfoot? They say oh yeah okay, and then you know the Rangers they'll talk to you for a little bit you know, and so oh, they're very cool, they're very cool about it you know. Now, there was a time where they yeah. weren't, from what I understand, but now now that you know Salt has been on Monster Quest and been on the Finding Bigfoot and all that you know, the Rangers are they're very they're very cool with it you know people want to go look for Bigfoot at Salt Fork you know, they don't have a problem with that they'll they drive up and ask you what you're doing that's about it. And, yeah. and I'm not saying they don't have a right to ask you what you're doing there. I mean that that's 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 a that's something that anybody could do because they're there to make sure you know what you're doing. Because in most right. of the, at least out here in the West, if you have a campfire, you need a campfire permit, and we want to make sure you have a shovel and water and all that stuff that needs so you don't start a forest fire. That's what we're interested in. But mm. you know that even if you have they you know tons of guns with you, you know that's legal in the United States of America. And so unless you have something like a Burning Man event where you have 20,000 people and no porta potties you know, you, there really is no limit of the amount of people or, or anything. Unless, unless you are charging, like if you're doing an expedition and you're charging the people to come on your expedition a fee to be at your expedition on Forest Service lands, then you do need a permit. If it's all mm. free, there's nothing anybody can tell you. Right. That's just just so exactly how the ECBR does. We're not like the BFRO. Everything's free. <laughs> and nothing against the BFRO. Generally, I got a lot of friends with them. <laughs> so. yeah. Oh, and I have friends in the BFRO, too. I mean, it's not that, but it's just the difference. And the the reason they give you a permit is to make sure that you have, like, porta potties and so that we're not causing environmental damage. Uh, to that particular location. That's all that's for. It's that, you know, that, you know, 20 people camping in one spot has an effect on the land and the water and other resources. And so, you know, that's all that's for. Yeah, Shaggy, with this information she just shared, we need to definitely make sure we pass it along to uh, Tracy Arnold. Because, uh, yeah, yeah, that man was down. harassed. Yeah, 
yeah, he was definitely harassed to move out to be told out. Cause that's public land. I've been down there with him. He he showed me where he researched it. Uh, you know, he's like a good three hours south of me, and I mean that's all public land. That's all part of the Jefferson National Forest, and we got the George Washington National Forest, which pretty much dominates the western, you know, from most of you know connects off of the Jefferson down south. Comes all the way up to Northern Virginia, and then, and then like what Kathy was sharing, the you got the state park, you know, which we have here along the Skyline Drive with, you know, you know the Blue Ridge Mountains here. Of course, you know that's you got guidelines. You need permits to camp here. If you're going to camp in the wilderness, you know, outside of a campground, you need to you you only allow to camp up to three days. It's a primitive camp. You're well, only allowed to have camp. like. The wilderness sorry, does have special. A, a wilderness area does have special uh, accommodations, and so yeah. that will depend on what where you're at. And so the best thing to do is every U.S. Forest Service office sells what we call recreation maps, and they're that folded, godforsaken map you can never get back to its original size, no matter what you do. And yeah. it, it will list all the rules that there are. Like so, like in our wilderness. We don't require a permit if you just go in for the day. But if you're going to spend the night, we want to know what your itinerary is. And it's not because we're being nosy. It's just if you don't come home, we want to know where you should have been so we can go look for you. That's all that. Right. And and believe me, that saved many, many people's lives. So it's not, not to restrict you. Nothing we do is intended to restrict you. It's to benefit you and benefit the land. And so you should right. look at it like that. But but if people are having problems, then they need to go into the Forest Service office and figure out what's going on because, you know, and I've had plenty in my day where I never told the person who was talking to me that I was a Fed. And, and I've had state guys try to tell me, you know, blah, 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 and I'll go, mm, no, I'm sorry, you don't have any authority here, you're a state official on federal land, and and then they quickly back down. But if you don't know what the rules are and you don't know what your rights are, that's when they try to intimidate you. Hey, Kathy, I'm going to interrupt you. we got 30 uh, minutes, uh, excuse me, 30 seconds left uh, for the live listeners. It's still recorded afterwards. But I want to let the listeners know, uh, to the public, we're about to go off air. Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening in, tuning in. Uh, you know, with our guest, she's been amazing. Uh, Kathy, stand Hello, by for a second. Year. Oh, yeah, happy oh. new year! And be sure to tune in January 6th. Yep, every Friday night, 10 p.m. And actually, we're actually officially off air to the public, but we're still actually recording, even though it's off air to public listeners. So, <laughs> I, did, I didn't want to cut you off like that, I just want to make that last a little bit of announcement. No, that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I wish I could go longer, but I, I can't afford to run the shows longer. <laughs> but I wish I could. <laughs> uh, oh, that's okay. Yeah. My, my voice is about giving out anyway, so. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. I know I, I, sometimes I know we, we get into the great conversation, and I'm telling you what, you've been so informative. I mean, you're – let me tell you this. We've had more – tuned in listeners i mean we might have more but i'm only i can only view up to so much on here and you know there's people that was listening in off of facebook that can't come on here and chat but you're like the most uh tuned in guest that i've had since i've been running this squash show radio uh radio uh block talk radio show and uh i tell you what i mean shaky were chatting off the side on uh, private messenger and uh, we both agree, and I know Henry does too. Uh, but you know, you're like mm-hmm. the, you're very awesome. <laughs> Your information oh, was you. spot on, and you, we, I mean, oh, you were like, you gotta come we, back. yes, you need to, if if all possible. That if you sure. want, bring Bob yeah. with you. <laughs> if Bob's willing to do oh, this, we'd love to have Bob too. Bob <laughs> is much more interesting than I am, so. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I mean I can't thank you enough for agreeing to do this with us. Uh this is a this has been a great time and uh we, we really loved having you on here tonight. Most definitely. Oh well thank you for having me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. So um before we go off, I don't know, did Henry or uh Shaky, do you guys have anything else you want to share or ask her before we uh say goodnight? 
No, just uh, thank you very much, Kathy, for coming on. It was great talking to you again. And, um, you know, great guest. I mean, Kathy's always a great guest. She always does a great job, you know. Absolutely. Kathy and I have known each other a long time, and you know, we're good friends. So it's always great to talk to friends. So. It is. Absolutely. It is. Especially on the day before New Year's Eve. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, uh, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I had a, you know, I'm not a drinker, but I had a few tonight. So, you know, (laughs) it was worth it. I work hard all week. So (laughs) I was, uh, I was due for something. So, (laughs) um, yeah, um, yeah, in, in the near future, definitely love to have you back again. Um, and, you know, like I said, uh, I know the listeners can't hear this, but um, which I'll make a separate public announcement later. But um, for those who do get to listen to this later on in the archives, uh, the ECBRO, uh, the 2017 year is already being planned out uh, more than expected. Uh, we got a lot going on within the first few months, which is, I mean, it's almost overwhelming, but it's so exciting. Um, I got uh, the end of January we have uh, a Bigfoot seminar we're holding here at one of the local libraries. Uh, Shaky, I don't know if um, has Michael Cook contacted you yet. Nope. Okay, he said he was going to get in touch with you about that. See if you want to come down and participate with that. Um, but right now, me, it's going to be me and Michael Cook. We're going to be speaking at that, and uh, you know, just kind of filling in and hopefully gathering some more information because uh, uh, lately I've been gathering a lot of fresh reports, a lot of information from hunters uh these are people not inside the bigfoot community i've been reaching outside the bigfoot community i've been trying to contact and you know throw information that draws them in and i've been getting some a, a lot of interesting stuff so and people are actually what you, they're sharing stuff out of the woodwork because that's one thing i believe in is reaching out to the public you, you know it's just like with the find a bigfoot when they do their you know their uh town hall meetings there's people out there they have no clue. They don't. They they experience something, but they don't know who to turn to or to share or get it off their chest. That's what I'm doing. I, I'm throwing it out there. And say, hey, this is what I do. I want to hear from you. You know. <laughs> so, um, and and the and the reports have been growing over the last couple of years, and all of a sudden it spiked pretty high here in the last day and a half, which shocked the heck out of me. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, give or take, there was one that's more on the paranormal side of things, which I'm not gonna throw that out. Uh, completely, but uh, I'm going to turn that over to a, one of my friends that's into the paranormal. I, I, I consider some things paranormal. I haven't really gotten into the paranormal thing entirely too much, but so, <laughs> but uh, it's all interesting still. It's all interesting stuff, but um, and you know, of course, hey, Daniel, at the I'm, end of, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm going to go ahead and click off. I'm about to have a coughing fit and I, uh, it's going to be awful. Oh, not hey. a problem, not a problem. Thank you again, Kathy. Okay. Say hi. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Say hi to Bob for me. I will. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you for having me. All right. God bless. Okay. All right. Bye. Wow, I'll tell you what, guys, she was amazing, wasn't she? <laughs> That's the yeah. first time I got yeah. to talk with her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you were right. You were right, uh, Henry. She, she, She's a great person. Yeah. I love her information. Yeah, awesome. yeah. she's great. I mean, because you should see my notepad. Everything she was talking about, I was jotting down everything, you know, little things here and there, things that, that's you know, things that she, a lot of what she was saying, I swear, I swear she's like, everything that me and Shaky talk about and agree about, you know, aren't, it's like she was hitting spot on. I was like, man, this is what people need to hear, you know, <clears throat> especially when she was talking about the DNA. Uh, when I brought up Mel, uh, Melba Ketchum, you know, mm-hmm. People were calling Haskell Hart. If you saw the comments on the, my uh, podcast show that I have with Doctor Haskell Hart, I mean, people call them names, you know, you know, ugly names. Which I was like, these people just have no clue, do they? I mean, these people don't look into the stuff for themselves. I mean, if they give it the time, the research for themselves, you know, they're they're hearing some person. They don't. Even, they probably don't even know who Ras- uh, Haskell Hart is. I mean, yeah, he's retired from the field. You know, he's a naturalist and. I mean, the man's very intelligent, and he broke it. He broke everything down for us in lame terms, you know. So it was very helpful with what he shared, you know. And, uh, you know, so I mean, then and then she shared her information, 
you know, she was very simple and straight to the point. And uh, it was a, it, it, to me, it was a, uh, a breath of fresh air. <laughs> it really was to hear her. And I hope other others get to hear her too, you know? So yeah, she's a great person. So, um, tell you what, gentlemen, I know it's, uh, it's late for you guys. I'm going to, there's a few things I want to work on. Um, it's been a great show. I want to thank you, uh, Henry for coming on. I try to get a Shane on here. He said he's, he had something going on. He had to get up early in the morning for something. Uh, he's going to do something with family, so <laughs> he wasn't able to jump on with us tonight. So, but it's all good. <laughs> um, but uh, see, we're actually still recording. Do you guys have anything you want to uh, throw out there for their future reference uh, to the public? No, I, just, I I had a lot of fun with this, Daniel. This was great. Thank you for the invite, by the way. Oh, absolutely. You're invited back anytime you want. I, I usually awesome. go live every Friday night, every Friday night, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Unless something comes up, I usually try to make an announcement on my Facebook page, letting people know uh, there won't be a show for whatever reason. But, uh, yeah, usually we go live every Friday night, so at 10 p.m. Cool. So, yeah. But uh, I know uh, Shane's got his, uh, that new show coming up uh, he wants to do. I'm mm-hmm. definitely looking forward to yeah. that. Isn't that on the 8th, the 7th or 8th? Uh, I will ask him. I'll I'll ask him. On, I'll, I'll PM him on Facebook. I'll ask him about it. Okay. Because uh, so I want to show Moth- hey, We're going to have that Mothman show um, on the 13th. On the 13th. Okay. I got it. Yeah. I wrote that down on my other notepad. I need to rewrite that down. Yeah. Okay, but that should be very Bigfoot, interesting. The Finding Bigfoot after show is going to be on the 8th. On on. on January 8th, they'll be, after Finding Bigfoot goes off, they'll be at 11 Eastern, 10 Central. Okay. Hey, Henry. Uh, yeah, I, I got a friend. I got a friend, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to put his name out right here, but I'm gonna, I'll am i send you the I'll send you his name. Uh, he's in Southern Illinois, Daniel Dixon, and Oh, he's yeah. A researcher, and he has some um, information about the Mothman out there, and he just had a sighting a few weeks ago himself. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'd appreciate so that. I'll, 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 sure, I'll yeah. Take, I'll take his name on, I'll message you his name, and then you can get hold of him, and he can probably tell you more. Yeah. Well, Shane, maybe, said, Shane said he wanted us to present, he, he wanted us to do some homework. So, hey, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll present that. that. That'll be what I'll present. The, the most recent <laughs> signing of the Mothman. Yeah. Well, hey, mate, hey, Henry, maybe you could, uh, pre- as part of your homework presentation, maybe you could get him to pop on, <laughs> like copy and paste I can, the, I, the link I, to I, him. Yeah, then, I can make the attempt. Yeah, I can make the attempt. Sure. Like, yeah, like do it like this. Like, don't tell Shane about it. Say, well, here's what I'm going to present. And then, you know, at that time, <laughs> yeah, yeah like at that, that time, dude's listening and he clicks on in. Now, well, thing is, you might have to set something up ahead of time. I don't know if that, uh, the individual he's referred to. I don't know if he ever has ever done a live. Oh, wait a minute. He may have done a live, a live YouTube thing. He he, he needs to do his live, own. He did. He did the level. We did our math, math man story. Okay. And um, he had to do it with the phone. He had, I had to put the phone on the speaker, but he just Leo and I were on on Skype, but he had to do it over the phone. Ah, uh, okay. Huh. Okay, yeah, because I know he he used to do his own little uh uh shows. He do, he, he does pre recordings, and then he'll upload them afterwards. But yeah, he could get on. He should be able to get on to a live podcast. He's got a YouTube channel, so and a setup. So yeah, if he gets sent the link, he should be able to join in without a problem because he's got the camera. Um, I think what okay, it is great. it depends. Yeah. Yeah, he lives at home with family, so he would have to make sure he has access to the the, the computer. I think. Mm-hmm. So. Right. Yeah, that's the only thing. He's a he's a great guy. He's a, you know a young guy. He's very you know very down to earth. Uh, yeah, you would definitely li- like him. He's a good guy. So. Yeah. All right, I just sent you his name, and he's on my he's on my friends list, and he's probably on Daniel's friends list also. Okay, I just got the PM but, from you, Shaky. Yeah, I I just got the PM. Yeah. So. 
Because I'm on my so, phone. I have, Facebook. Like I, said, I, have, I have Facebook notifications on my phone, so I just got your PM. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. All, right. All right, guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say good night for now, but thanks, Daniel, so much for the invite. I had so much fun. This was great. Um, and we'll talk to you guys later. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're going to rock yeah. out. We're going to end the show with Stacey Brown's show. So you guys have a good night. All right. Own radio. If you're not a follower, become a follower. If you're not a subscriber to YouTube channel, ECBRO98, be sure to subscribe. Everybody, I want to thank you guys for tuning in. We have nothing but the best and the greatest guests ever. Every Friday night, 10 p.m. Spread the word. Help the Squatch Own Radio become well known. Spread us around your YouTube pages, uh, your Google pages, your Facebook forums, et- everywhere. <laughs> Let it be known. Um, sometimes we have open discussions on here. We want you to a part of it uh, every Friday night, man. God bless. If you don't sit in your lucky seat, your team could lose. So don't leave your lucky seat. But do pick up your phone or computer and order B-dubs to go. Or if you've got a big group, call in for the party menu. That way you can order wings, pick them up, and get back to your lucky seat. And if you do lose while sitting in your lucky seat, you can still feel lucky eating your feelings. Spicy feelings. Keep your superstitions. We do it for you. Buffalo Wild Wings. Wings, beer, sports. Prices and participation vary. See participating locations for details. Void were prohibited. Hi, this is Maury Moreland Morrison, here to tell you GEICO has more than just great savings. Much more. Yes, while GEICO could help you rack up more moolah faster than you can say metamorphosis, they've also been the fastest growing auto insurer for more than 10 years. That's more like it. Furthermore, GEICO has fast and friendly claim service. That might seem like an oxymoron, but it's not. All the more reason to say no other auto insurer has more more than GEICO. GEICO. Expect great savings and a whole lot more.